Praise the Lord. And it's good to be here again. Amen. Just to be able to impart. Amen. And to give out. Amen. What the Lord has given to us, me and Valerie. And uh, just want to thank everybody. Amen. That, uh, that makes it possible for these things to happen. But I don't take it lightly this morning. Amen. I, I don't take standing behind the pulpit lightly. I don't take preaching the gospel lightly. Amen. I think that it's real important, amen, for us to hear God's word so that we can grow because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And uh, there are some messages, amen, that you just got to put your seatbelt on because there's going to be turbulence. <laughs> amen. When I get on a plane, now, first of all, I don't like to fly, all right? I'm going to probably have a hard time in the rapture when we get taken, amen, because I'm going to be like, but... It doesn't matter, amen, because we're saved. So if it goes down, we go up. And um, I don't like when the pilot gets on there and says, well, you know, it's going to be a smooth ride for about 40 minutes. And then we're going to hit some clouds or something. He starts telling me, I'm, uh, I'm looking at my watch, 40 minutes. Oh, God, here we go. Amen. But we've been flying around a little bit, so now it kind of puts me to sleep. Amen. So it's all right, amen, and so I thank God for that, amen, and, and I want to thank everybody. I want to thank all the pastors, amen, can't name you all because there's so many, amen, but want to thank all you pastors, amen, doing a tremendous job, amen. I want to thank the first lady, amen, Sister Julie and Pastor Sonny, amen, and Pastor Tim and his wife, and then the mother of the church, amen, Sister Mitzi, amen, that played and plays a very important role, amen, in our existence there in Texas, Amen. And uh, we are growing. We are taking the land. We are launching our churches. We're, we're doing what we were taught. Amen. And uh, I think that being that we're kind of like so far, it kind of keeps our churches away from all the politics that take place in ministry. Say amen. amen. Say amen if you know what I'm talking about. Amen. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't even worry about it. But because we're out there, amen, we have to really, really, you know, I remember Pastor Ray when he sent us out, he said, you know, you're used to being around this and you're used to being around us, but you're going to have to now just depend on God and continue praying and seeking him and reading your word. And there's not going to be anybody there to tell you what to do. You're going to have to now do it on your own. And we took that advice and we ran with it. Amen. And there are some great things happening, amen. And uh, it's good to be here with Vince, amen. He said that he wasn't here to hear me, but he really is here to hear me. No, he's not. He's here in business. And our condolences, amen, to Gonzalez family. And uh, it's just good to be here this morning, amen. So I want to preach to you uh, a, a message that um, really caused, like, for me not to be able to sleep, amen. Because I love San Jose, Amen. I love San Jose. I mean, there's no place I'd rather be than in San Jose on top of Dallas. Amen. Right. But when it when when we're here, I mean, I feel good. Amen. I feel good. I feel at home and I feel like there, there is no holding back. Amen. I'm going to give it to you the way God gave it to me, because any preacher that puts messages together, they put messages together because it's God speaking to that preacher first. Amen. So I hope that makes somebody feel better before you hear my title. Amen. That I got it first. Amen. I got beat down by this message first by the Holy Spirit. And I repented. I made my altar call. And then now I have full access and full liberty to preach it. Amen. And so as I pray for San Jose and also our church, and uh, I, I got a message. And, and I, was, I had a message. It was called, you know, losing your destiny. And then God said, no, I want you to do Revelations chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. And I said, no, because I don't want to offend nobody. And then he says, it's not about offending anybody. It's just giving what I gave to you to give to them. Amen. And so I want to talk to you about not losing your first love. Amen. And, and we're going to reminisce a little bit. And, and I hope I don't take too long, but I probably will. But I hope that you're ready. Amen. Revelations chapter 2. I want you to go there with me. And uh, as we go there, I want you to know that this church is the first church that God gives a revelation to John there on the island of Patmos. And it's the first church that he gives this revelation to because this church, the church of Ephesus, was a church that Paul worked in for three years. 
and he labored there diligently and a revival took place. God moved in a mighty way. People got saved. Many heard about the gospel. You can read about it in the book of Acts chapter 19 where revival took place in Ephesus. This is where the apostle Paul even says that there is an effective door that has opened unto me, but there are many that have opposed me. There are many that are trying to stop me, but nothing can stop the work of God. Nothing can stop what God has established and what God says we need to do. We need to live listen to him and we need to run with the vision and we need to build God's church for his honor and for his glory say amen so revelations chapter one let's read that first revelations chapter one verses three you have it say amen blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy and blessed are those that hear it and take heart what is written in it because the time is near revelations chapter 2 1 to 7 to the angel of the church of ephesus write these are the words of him that holds the seven stars in his right hand walks among the seven golden lampstands i know your deeds your hard work your perseverance i know that you cannot tolerate wicked men that you have tested those that claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardship for my name. And have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent. Do the things you did at first. If you do not repent. I will remove the lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give the right to eat at the tree of life, which is in paradise, the paradise of God. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you. We ask this morning that you would have your way and that you would speak so clear that every one of us that is here would understand what the Spirit is saying. Help us, God, to get a hold of what it is you want us to do. Bless this church. Bless all those that work hard in it. We love you. We thank you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody says. Everybody says. To the seven churches, John gets a revelation. And God gives him a revelation of seven churches. But he mentions one of them first. This section is directed to the churches. And also, it is relevant for the churches of America today. That the churches in America need to hear what the Spirit is saying. The church is the body of Christ. Say amen. We know that Jesus, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 25, gives us a clear description of what he does for the church. The Bible says that he loves the church so much that he gave his life for her. He loves the church so much that he died for the church. From chapter 1 to chapter 3, the word church is mentioned 19 times. From chapter 4 to chapter 20, the word church is not mentioned not one time. And it's not mentioned no more because the church have been raptured out of the earth because the time is near. We read about it. We heard that verse. Revelation chapter 1, verses 3, that the time was near. These churches had a direct message from Jesus, and he knew exactly what they were going through. When you look at the books, and when you look at the stories of chapter 2 and chapter 3, you can see that inside of these messages that he writes to these churches, there are three things that he mentions to these churches that is said to all of them. He says it to Ephesus. He says it to Smyrna. He says it to Pergamos. He says it to Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, 
Laodicea. What does he say to these churches? While well, he tells these churches some things that are the same. He ends them the same. To all seven churches, he says this. I know your deeds. You'll find that words. I know your deeds in all seven churches. In all seven churches, you will also find. To him who overcomes. You will find that in all seven churches, that is written. The third thing that you'll find in all seven of the churches is he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. And I know everybody here has an ear. But he's talking about the ear of the heart. That we would hear the message with the ears of the heart. What is he saying here? Well, he's giving a promise and he's giving a rebuke. John had been at this church, and John seen the conditions of this church. Not only John was there, not only Paul was there, but Timothy also pastored there. It is Jesus that speaks. It's Jesus that is telling these churches what he sees in them that are good and what he sees in them that are not good. Revelations chapter 1. I want you to look at verses 12. I hope you're quiet because you're taking notes. And I turned to see a voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a robe, reached down to his feet, and with the gold sash around his chest. His head and his hair was like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like the bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of a rushing water. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his hand, said, don't be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive and forever. I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand are the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. I read all that to tell you two things. Number one, Jesus is the one speaking to the seven churches through the revelation of John. Not only that, but he's telling them that the angels that are over all these churches are the pastors and all the leaders in the church. This revelation is an encouragement, but it is also a warning. The reason why he mentions the church of Ephesus first is because it was the light of Asia. The apostle Paul knew that if he could crack the church there in Ephesus, that it would be a launching pad, that it would be a springboard so that they could reach all of Asia. I don't know about you, but the founder of this church, my friend, years ago said that if we could crack this city, if we could crack open the city, it is a gateway to the rest of Northern California and beyond. The church of Ephesus was mentioned first for a reason. This message, my friend, is a promise and a threat. Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 to the angels of the church of Ephesus write, These are the words of him that holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Ephesus was famous. It was a famous city. You can read the book of Ephesus, of Ephesians. And you can read it also in Acts chapter 19. It was famous because of the temple of Diana. And Paul labored there for years. 
He put Timothy there as an overseer of the church, but that was only temporary. In verses 1, it says that he holds, that he holds, which means that the pastors, means the leaders, that we are all to hold on and to hold fast. Chapter 2, verses 25, you can look at that. He could give us reference. Only hold on to what I have until I come. Chapter 3, verses 11. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. Here we find that those that are in the church, not just the pastors and not just the leaders, but I know that every mother and every father, every brother and every sister, every man in the men's home, every woman in the women's home, everybody that is a part of this church and a part of this body of Christ, God is saying, you better hold on and you better hold on tight because it's going to get bumpy and it's going to get rough. But I'm going to give you the power and I'm going to give you the ability to be able to endure hardship as a good soldier. Hold on you got to hold on. We need to grasp Jesus. We need to hold on to ministry. And what does the scriptures tell us in 225 and 311 until he comes? There is something that all seven churches needed to do. They needed to stay busy and they needed to keep their fervor and they needed to keep their zeal and they needed to keep their passion burning for God until he comes. It is all of our jobs to do that. Hold on. He walks among us through the Holy Spirit, protecting the church from Satan. This is what the leaders do. This is what the pastors do. This is what all of us should do. We should protect our vision. God bless all three. I said we should protect our vision. I said, protecting the vision is being there for the vision, is making the vision relevant in your life, making the vision real in your life, talking the vision, speaking the vision, teaching the vision, living the vision, dreaming the vision. Jesus said he died for the church. We ought to die for the church too. We should have that same desire to give our life for the ministry and to give our lives for the vision. God bless you, Vince Strangers. Anybody else? He walks among us. Jesus walks among his church. This is his church. I said, this is his church. In verses 2, chapter 2. I know your deeds. I know your deeds. He says, I know your deeds twice. This is God that knows everything. How many know that God knows everything? I, I would say the word, but I, I was tongue-tied with it. It reminds me of Pastor S. Sometimes he couldn't say words. I can't either. Well, let, let me try. Okay. I'm trying. Omniscience. Omniscience. See, I got it out, but don't have me say it again. Because what it means is that God knows everything. God even knows what you're thinking right now. Why is he yelling at us? When is it going to be over? I'm hungry. I want to watch the game. I, I got to get out of here. Listen, if you made an effort to get up this morning, if you made an effort to take a shower, if you made the effort to get in your car, you should make an effort to sit here all day long. Como que when is it over? Revelation chapter 2, verses 2. He says, I know your hard work. Victory outreach San Jose. Victory outreach around the world. Churches around the globe. God knows our hard work. We are good workers. We love to work for God. I love to work for God. But if I'm going to work for God, listen, let us all be high task and high relationship. 
There are too many that are working for God and your low relationship, high task. You'll do everything you have to do, but you will not talk to nobody. You will not shake nobody's hand. When they say go out and greet each other, you don't budge. I've talked to Christians that have even come to church and said, well, I don't like people. I said, then what are you doing here? He says, I know your hard work. And he says it to all seven churches. He says, your labor unto weariness. That you worked so hard, that you worked yourself so tired, but you didn't give up. You didn't stop. You continue doing what God called you to do. Because God is the one that anoints you. And God is the one that gives you strength. And God is the one that empowers you. So you keep coming back. And you keep working. And you put your hands to the plow and you don't look back. Because if you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. Don't get tired of doing good for in due season. You shall reap if you faint not. Every test that the Spirit of God has given a believer, it's so that we could pass the test, not pass out during the test. I know your hard work. Victor, you're a hard worker. And your perseverance, which means patience. It also means endurance. Perseverance, patience, endurance. That we are patient. Is there anybody here that's impatient? Hallelujah, we got honest people in the house. We got to learn to be patient. I'm glad that somebody was patient with me and Valerie when we first came back May 19, 1982 on a Wednesday night at 7 o'clock on the east side that somebody was patient with us. And they took their time after we messed up and messed up and messed up. They persevered. Then he says, I know that you cannot tolerate you cannot tolerate, you cannot tolerate or bear or put up with evil men and evil things. Wicked men, false brethren. You've been tested. He says this church had the gift of discernment. This church knew when somebody wasn't flying straight. Discernment, my friend, you can look at the book of Acts. And you can look at Peter when he looked at Ananias and Sapphira and said, you know, is this the amount you brought? You didn't lie to me, you lied to the Holy Ghost. I know that the punishment doesn't fit the crime. But it was the first established church. It was the first time the Holy Spirit was introduced to the world and introduced to people. And he was going to use Ananias and Sapphira as an example. Don't play church. See, if you play church, that means you have to go to the devil to get the rules. They had the gift of discernment. They also seen those that were in their church. They claimed to be apostles. But these men that claimed to be apostles, they sowed seed of heresy. Heresy is their belief and their opinion contrary to doctrine. Well, I don't know why they say that the Trinity, I don't know about the doctrine of glossolalia, and I don't know the doctrine of all these, uh, all these things. That are, no, listen, my friend. You go to Vethi so that you can learn. You come to church so that you can learn. You take notes so that you can learn. You read your Bible so that you can learn. You pray so that you can learn. And you won't be involved in heresy. These things were in the church here. Don't you dare say, well, I'm thank I thank God it doesn't happen here. It happens here. It happens in my church. It happens all the outreaches. It happens everywhere. They sneak in. They creep in. They bring too much of the world with them. You're supposed to leave the world at the altar. Say amen. My friend, this is a picture when you look at verses 3. I'm going to break down every verse if I can. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name. And you have not grown weary. 
But I want you to know, we're getting close to verse 4. It's going to mess up this whole message. You've endured hardship. You've endured hardship. Because there are some that have come in to oppose the work. There are some that have come in to try to stop the work. You can't stop what you can't see. I say, you can't stop what you can't see. I'll get the worship team and start singing it. They endured hardship. Victory outreach San Jose. Every member in this church. From Notre Dame all the way to here. Because that's when I came. We've endured hardship. We put up with a lot. Oh, but God has still shown himself faithful to you and I. God has shown himself faithful to me, faithful to you. He's always shown up. He is Jehovah Nicotine. <laughs> Through the hardship, they didn't faint. They kept working for Jesus. They didn't grow weary. I know it's easy to grow weary at times. I know sometimes there's so much going on and we get tired and we go weary. I mean, we just got back from San Antonio. We were there on Monday. We had to set up for the, for the leadership, the retreat they had there. Then we flew out Friday. Then we go back on Tuesday. We stay there four days and then we go back to Los Angeles for Pastor Sonny's birthday. Then we go home and we kick back. We ain't moving no more. I don't know how you do it, Sister Mitzi. I don't know how Pastor Sonny and Sister Julie do it. But you can get weary and you can get tired. But there is something about having a prayer life. There is something about being connected to the connection. I was standing in my seat earlier and I was watching the home. We were singing and I seen them jumping and jumping and jumping and jumping. I felt like jumping in there. But then I know that people would look and say, oh, he thinks he's holier than thou. So I stood in my seat and I envied them. But then as I looked at them, the Spirit of God told me, that's what happens when you wake up every day and you pray. That's what happens when you get Bible studies every day. That's what happens when you wake up and you get rebuked and you get corrected. That's what happens when you're able to get a hold of God. That's evidence. That was us once. Huh? Huh? They didn't care. But all you guys that were doing that, when you do become a pastor, keep doing it. When you do become an evangelist, keep doing it. When you get it launched out, keep doing it. Now verse 4. I know. I feel the same way. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. You forsook your first love. God, first you encourage me. First you pump me up. You want me to know all the good things that I did for you. You displayed it. You said it. You wrote it. I heard it. Now you're saying, that I have abandoned my first love, it means this, you have abandoned your first faith. You have let your faith grow weary. You have let your faith fall off. And God holds it against us. He said, I have something against you, that you lost your first love. He says, the work you did, the work you put in, the building, the structure, the buying, the giving, the testing. It was all great. But first and foremost, taking us back to the day that we received Jesus. The day that we got saved. The day that we were crying because he delivered us from being in the neighborhood. Delivered us from being gang members and drug guys. Delivered us from dancing your life away all night in the studio 47. You cast off your first faith. In other words, he says you change the way you believe. 
You believe one way, but now something happened and it changed you. The book of Ephesians, I have to take you there. The book of Ephesians, when you go there with me, I hear you in your app. I hear your phones. Chapter 1, verses 15. Say amen when you have it. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love, and your love, your love, and I heard about your love for God and all of God's people. Paul writes from Acts, when he writes Ephesus, it's 30 years span. There's 30 years in between that he writes this letter to the Ephesians. And within those 30 years, their zeal and their passion and their love for Jesus it was still boiling hot. It was still fired up. Yeah, they worked and yeah, they strategized and yeah, they did everything they had to do. But their love for Jesus never departed. But it departed as soon as Paul left. As soon as Paul was taken out of the picture and out of the church, everything changed. False teachers crept in. Spirit of apathy crept in. They say that years later, now Ephesus is today Turkey. They say years ago, they went to the church of Ephesus and they found three people in that church. There was only three people. These are fifth century books that tell us these things. It was apostles and new disciples of disciples of disciples of disciples of disciples that wrote these things. That are not in the Bible canon. That are not with the 66 books. But it tells us history. That when they went back into this church, they found three people that were members of that church only. And when they asked them, do you know Paul? They didn't know Paul. They asked them, do you know John? They didn't know John. They asked her, do you know Timothy? They did not know Timothy. The vision was erased. It was gone. People started taking on their own belief. People started doing what they wanted to do. Their love right here in the book of Ephesians, it was still bo boiling hot. So in chapter 5 of Revelation chapter 2, he says, remember the height from which you have fallen. Go back and do the things that you did at first. If you don't do it, he says, I will remove the lampstand from its place. I am so glad. Listen to me. I am so glad that he says, I'll remove the lampstand. I am so glad that he doesn't say, I will take it away. He doesn't say, I'm going to take it away. He just says, I'm going to remove it. He says, remember. You know why he says, remember? Remember. Because if anybody here did lose their first love, you can't remember where you lost it. It is not my responsibility. It is not the pastor's responsibility. It is not the leader's responsibility to remind you where you lost it. You must remember the height from which you have fallen. That we could go back and look. Say, this is when everything changed for me. It was when this happened. It was when this took place. It was when they said this. It's when I was challenged by this. That I changed my faith. That I bailed out. Quick story. Judas, one of the 11th apostles. He was the holder of the bag. You know that Judas, the reason why he betrayed Jesus was because he followed Jesus, but he seen things that the others didn't see. And you know what Judas seen? Judas seen all the negative. Judas always wondered, why does Jesus get a ride on a donkey, and why do we have to walk? Judas always looked at the negative by saying, why do we have to eat the people's leftovers? 
Why do we have to pick up the people's crumbs? Why do we have to sleep in a room with all these men? Hey, that money should have been given and sold and given the money to the poor. He had his own way of looking because his faith changed. His first love changed. But you know what he thought? He thought that the ministry of Jesus lost its direction. And he felt like, I need to get this ministry back on track. And the way that we're going to do that is that we're going to go ahead and sell Jesus. He is a great example of somebody that is there and sees it all, seeing the miracles, seeing people healed, seeing them walk on water, seeing blind eyes open, deaf ears open up, the mute begin to speak. He's seen it all but still doubted. Peter says we need to choose somebody. So they got this guy named Justice and Matthias, and they cast lots. Leadership. Both of them were there saying, we're going to be the 11th apostle. High, high five to you. May the best man win. Peter. All right, Matthias. You it, partner. You're in. All right, hey! You know. Graffiti foul. And good leadership is justice standing there knowing I've just been rejected by God. God said no to me, but it's okay. It's okay because every requirement and stipulation that falls on the 11th apostle that is Matthias is also going to fall on me because even though I don't have a title and even though I don't have position and even though I don't have a name in the church, I'm still going to do everything that a leader does, everything that a pastor does. I'm still going to live this life for God. There's a big difference with David being in the field, being chosen, and his brothers were all rejected. Later on when David goes to battle, ah, oh, we know you're conceited. Who did you leave the little sheep with? Big difference. They lose their faith along the way. They get weary. They get tired. And your thinking is not like the book of Acts of one mind and one accord. You're on a different viaje. You're on a different trip. This is why you won't come back tonight. This is why you won't show up on Friday. This is why you don't go to Bible study. This is why you didn't give a nickel to run for hope. I might not be invited no more. <laughs> Remember how high you were when God's love fell from you. He tells them to repent. That's it. Repent. Ask for forgiveness. And then the promise is given to all the churches becomes their promise to him who overcomes. I will give the right. To him that overcomes, I will give the right. Another promise, he that has an ear, somebody's hearing. Somebody is listening with the ears of their heart and they're repenting. We must live a life of repentance. Verse 5 says, do the things you did at first. I'm not here to raise the dead. I said, I'm not here to raise the dead. But I remember everybody, 99 Notre Dame, my era, my season, my birthplace, everybody witnessed. Everybody brought people. We all showed the Duke of Earl movie everywhere we went. We did it at the performing arts. We did it at the Civic Auditorium. We put it on Channel 11 when they said you'll never be able to put it on Monday night at the movies. We did Nikki Cruz Crusades more than once or twice. And we did over 200,000 flyers. We had 70 Bible studies. We witnessed all the time on King and Story. We had all night prayer meetings. We didn't end it at 12. We ended up at 5 o'clock and we were moved by the menudo after. We had Miracle Sundays where we gave our whole check to Jesus. Man, we ask you to do that, we'll probably lose half of the church. 
the worship team wrote their own worship songs. We showed the movie everywhere. We made 16 to life. Come on now. Books were written. I said books were written. Not one, not two, but three books were written. Billboards all over San Jose. We put posters of the face of Nikki Cruz on the transit system throughout San Jose. We bought land. Remember what thou hast done before and do those things. These are the things that built us. These are the things that excited us. These are the things that rejuvenated us. We were known as a teenager church. We were young, foolish, but we had faith. Behold, years later, here we are. We're still preaching the same gospel and it's still doing the same thing and it's still good for the sinner and it's good for the saint. After the ministry, there in this church of Ephesus, Paul and John, they had a strong Christian population. In Acts chapter 19, verses 10, Ephesus was the greatest ministry found there in that region. In Acts 19, verses 10, it also says, not everybody turned to God. Not everybody came to the knees and to the feet of Jesus. But everybody heard about Jesus. The whole city heard about Jesus. I want you to know that San Jose, not everybody in San Jose knows about Jesus. So you shouldn't roll your sleeves down. Nobody gave you permission to roll your sleeves down. You better roll them back up. On Paul's third missionary journey, he visits Ephesus and he stays there three years. No, two years. It was a moderate and a successful church. Until Paul left. There was a great Greek revival. Acts chapter 19 verses 17 to 20. It says that the Greeks came to Jesus. The intelligent. The white collar. The smart. The educated. The Greeks. Confess Jesus. This church of Ephesus. Held Jesus in high honor. Do we hold Jesus in high honor? Do we hold Jesus in high honor? You can say amen. I mean, what are you, scared or what? Do you hold Jesus in high honor? We all shall hold Jesus in high honor. They held him in high honor in verses 18. They openly confessed him there in the book of Acts. In verses 19, check this out. The Greeks got saved. The sorcerers got saved. That in the book of Acts chapter 19 verses 17 to 20. It says that these people brought all their books on sorcery. All their books on philosophy. All their books on witchcraft. And they burned them. That's how high they held Jesus up. You know the value. It tells us there in the book of Acts the value. But here is the value in modern English. The value of all the books that the Greeks burned because they got so turned on to Jesus was valued at $5 million. When you get on fire for God, when you never change your faith, when you stay enthused about the things of God, when you are there to protect the vision because you are a guardian of the vision, is there anybody here that's a guardian of the vision? I didn't say guardian, you know, of the galaxy or guardian of the vision. These are the things that they did at first. They did three things. They confessed all the time. They invested all the time. And they spread the message all the time. Because Jesus had become so powerful and so important to them that they invested in him. They invested their morality and confess. They invested their private life and removed evil from themselves. They invested their finances worth $5 million. 
That's what you do when you invest in somebody and something that you love so much. The Ephesian church had stopped remembering Jesus. They were known for their good deeds, but their bad doctrine. And Jesus slipped through the cracks. I'm almost done. Give me five minutes. Ten. So God speaks to this church. And in the midst of materialism, in the midst of degraded animalism, the temple of Diana with orgies and sexual sins, paganism and idol worship, dark heathenism, religion, they had lost their intense, enthusiastic devotion to the person of Jesus. In other words, they replaced Jesus with a hobby. They replaced Jesus with other things. This is how you lose your love. When you replace Jesus for something that's more important than him. You replace Jesus with something that's more important than the vision. You replace Jesus than something that's more important than coming to church. Now, I know you're here, so you're not the ones that need to hear this message. It's those that are not here that are to hear this message. But you are to be a transmitter of it. They had lost their intense, enthusiastic devotion. This great city and all its attractions were bringing to draw the believers away from their first love of Jesus. The church was so potent in evangelism. The areas that were there, they were so into it. They were always spreading the gospel that even Roman emperors and nobles of their day got saved. The story of David Brenner, worship team, you could come. 1887, David Brimmerman, something like that, I couldn't say last name. This man in the 1800s was called by God to preach to the Indians in, in, in New York. A revival broke out. He would go and preach to the Indians and go home. He would preach to them through the rain and through the snow and through bad weather. Then he got sick. He got tuberculosis. He couldn't travel as much as he wanted to. But even though he was sick and vomiting blood, he would jump on his horse in the snow. And he would try to get to his service and try to get to the Indians. And he would get on his horse. And he would get so sick that he would fall off his horse. And he would lay in the snow for an hour to an hour and a half. He trained his horse to stay right there and not move when this happens. When he would wake up, He was hurting, frostbite. You would think he would go home, but he would jump back on his horse and he would get to the service. And when he would get to the Indians, he would look up to heaven and say, God, I have failed you. I have failed you. But you know that I love you. You know that I love you. He did what he had to do because he loved Jesus. To the church of Ephesus, the revelation to John, he says, I will remove the lampstand from its place. It happened. He didn't say, I'm going to take it away. And thank God for that, that he's not taking it away. Even David says, take not your spirit from me. Forgive me my sin. Search me. But don't take your spirit from me. He doesn't say, I'm going to take it away from you. But this is what he did. He took the lampstand from the Middle East. He removed it. This is why the Middle East is the way it is. Jesus isn't allowed in Israel. He's not allowed in that whole region. Why? Because of what Jesus told John to tell the church of Ephesus, I'll remove the lampstand. He removed the lampstand and where did he take it? He brought it to America. He brought it to us. You are the lamp of Israel. You are the light of Israel. We are all that the sinner has. I said, you are all that the sinner has. You are the hope that they have. That's all. If you don't preach to them, then who is? He removed the lampstand. And he brought it here to us. And he says, if we don't repent, then he'll remove the lampstand. 
personally, if he's removed the lampstand from you, ask him to bring it back. I know that the church has been hit. I know that the church has gotten hit by the enemy. Things have happened. Caused our faith to shift. Fear ministry. You can't hide in an office all day long. And I'm going to end it with this. Let me end it with this, this. Because it's real important. He said, you have this in your favor. He says, you have this in your favor. This is hope. This is hope. He says, but you have this in your favor. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans. Who are the Nicolaitans? The Nicolaitans was a man by the name of Nicholas. Nicholas is one of the seven that was chosen by the apostles to be involved in the food pantry ministry full of the spirit. Nicholas is one of those guys. And what he did was that he turned agnostic. And he started pulling people out of the church with this false teaching and with this false doctrine. He says, you have this in your favor. You hate the work of the Nicolaitans and I hate them too. What is he saying? That I hate false teachers? No. That I hate the teachings of the occults. What was Nicholas teaching? Well, he turned from the gospel and he started to preach the God of Baal and fertility. He became so agnostic that he started to say, there's no such thing as God. We don't even believe in God. We shouldn't even talk about God. There's no such thing as faith. It's just chance. Just like the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons. They have no Middle East roots. Those roots are American roots. Created in the United States. They look good on the outside. But inside they're full of dead men bones. Danger on your doorstep every Saturday. What does he say? What does he tell us? You know what he tells us? He says, you got to put them out of a job. They're winning souls faster than you. They're more on fire than you. They have a zeal and a passion for their vision more than you. But you had it at one time. from which the height that thou hast fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If not, I'll remove the lampstand from his place. But you have this in your favor. And God says, because you still are holding on to that, the purity of the gospel, the purity of doctrine, sound doctrine, Jesus and the blood of Jesus still forgives the sins of sinners. The blood of Jesus still restores families. The blood of Jesus still heals and delivers and sets us free. It is the blood of Jesus. It's always been the blood of Jesus. It will always be the blood of Jesus. It will not be the blood of animals. It will not be the blood of anything else. It will always be the blood of Jesus. There is no salvation given under any other name but the name of Jesus. He says, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Nobody takes my life. I give my life. I lay down my life for mankind and for humanity. If Jesus doesn't remember your sins no more, then you shouldn't forget him. If his job is not to remember your sins, then your job is not to forget about him. Get so wrapped up in all the works and get so wrapped up in everything else that we forget what made this ministry what it is today. Souls, souls, give me souls lest I die. Raven Leonard Hill preached that message. Give me souls lest I die. A mentor of David Wilkerson. Is that your prayer? Give me souls lest I die or is it give me a title? Give me a license. Give me a position. Give me prestige. Give me attention. Give me the lights. Or is it give me souls lest I die? It's always been that. Last time I was here we preached on Matthew 25. 
what you've done unto them, you did it unto me. If you did it for the least of them, you did it for me. I speak for myself. I fight hard to not lose God's love out in Dallas. We're not here. You have all this here. We don't have all this. We don't have the camaraderie of all the churches all close-knit together. We have to travel if we want something from God as far as when it comes to the outreach. But we strive. We push ourselves. You have it here. Because of that, have you gotten comfortable? If you've gotten comfortable, get out of your comfort zone and get back in the combat zone. Get back in the battle. Bring people. Invite people. Volunteer to be a live group. Host your house. Make your own flyers. Don't wait for the graphic designers. I got four graphic designers. And I put all of them to work. Every one of them. Make this, make this, make this. Just, just promote it. I don't care. It's all over Facebook. But that's not good enough. Facebook ain't good enough. It's still always going to be the personal touch. It's always going to be the dos patas. It's always going to be talking to people. That's always going to work. You want to use Facebook and put all your stuff? That's fine. I do that. But I still do what I have to do. The personal touch. I want to lose my first love. I know I hammered that issue. I, I, I know you got it. Or did you? Or is it just another good sermon? We become sermon sippers. Don't sip on a sermon. Eat it. Take the scroll. Eat it. It'll be sweet in your mouth. But when it hits your stomach, will be bitter because of how honest you are. Every eye closed. Lift your hands. Let him that have an ear hear what the Spirit is saying. To eight churches, seven in Revelation, and the one that we stand in today. And to him that overcomes, I will give covenant rights. Why? Because to the seven churches in Revelation, he says, I know your deeds. I know your perseverance. I know everything. I know if your heart's involved or I know if you got bad motives, bad intentions, people pleaser. You're moved by the applause of people. Be moved by the Spirit. Be moved by the Spirit, saith God. Lord Jesus, I gave what you gave me. I speak to myself, God, through you. Let me not lose my first faith. When I was a gang member, God, running the streets here in the south side. When my dad got shot, when my sister was stabbed, when our house was shot up in the hospital watching my dad in the hospital watching my sister confused murdering my heart under the influence until I walked into a victory outreach and my life was totally changed Valerie's life was changed Help me to remember. Help me always to remember that, God. I repent. I repent, God. Forgive me, God, if I've forgotten. I'm not preaching this because I'm doing it and I'm perfect. I'm preaching it because God said to As we sing a song that is appropriate, you feel that tugging in your spirit. You have a calling in your life. You're going to go out and take a city. My advice is get on fire now. Don't get on fire when you get out there. Because if you ain't doing it here, you ain't going to do it there. You want to be a home director. 
then start discipling men now. You want to be a married couple's counselor, start doing it now. All the things that God has called us to do, start doing it now. Put your heart into it.